Father, I just ask in the name of your great son, Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah, Lord, that you would speak through me words of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment, most of all, truth. God, I pray that as I speak what you prepared and put on my heart today, you would inspire, challenge, and bring a critical understanding of a subject that is not only controversial, it is one of the least talked about subjects from pulpits today. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts to hear from you in the name of your son. And everyone said, amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to use my clicker tonight and begin. The end of the age. If you do not know this and you're watching this for the very first time and and maybe somebody sent this to you or uh, there are five other parts to this series that we go through. Everything from Jacob and Esau, how everything began, to when does the rapture happen, what does the timeline look like. This is the last in the series called End of the Age, part six, what is the millennial kingdom? What does it look like? What's it going to feel like? What's it going to smell like? Who's going to be there? Who's not going to be there? When does it happen? Does it happen? These are all questions we're going to answer tonight. In all of biblical prophecy, there are few topics more controversial and misunderstood than the topic of the millennial kingdom for sure. There are few topics more controversial. The millennial kingdom refers to thousand-year reign of Messiah And it's the same topic that is talked about in the Old Testament. So in the Tanakh, or what we call the Tanakh, there is a uh, there is prophecies about this time where the Messiah is going to come back. So there are prophecies in the Old Testament about when is the Messiah going to come back, and in the New Testament, or uh, in Hebrew, the Brit Hadashah, that same concept Christians are very familiar with. But not so much how familiar are they with the Old Testament prophecies that match it. So if we're going to understand what this topic looks like, we have to go back to what? The beginning. And that's exactly what we're going to do. The millennial kingdom refers to the thousand year, we're just going to be basic for a minute, reign of the Messiah. This reign of the Messiah, whom we know as Yeshua in Hebrew, which means salvation, In English, we're familiar with the term Jesus. The Son of God is seen as the same messianic kingdom anticipated by the prophets in the Tanakh. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 6, we're going to read it together. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years." This is really critical information because when this happens, when the enemy or the adversary, or in Hebrew, Hasatan, which is where we get the English Satan from, the adversary, when the adversary is bound for a thousand years, that alone will be a game changer. Would you agree? All right. So that is it. This particular verse is a key verse for understanding when the millennium happens and what it looks like. Let's continue. And threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Yeshua and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So if you're not familiar with the contents of this scripture about uh, the worshipping of the beast, the image, his name, uh, 666, the number of his name, I highly encourage you to go back and watch Uh, the other parts of the series where I do go through those things in detail. We're not going to do that tonight, but for the sake of tonight's message, I want to point out in the very beginning that Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years, and then there are going to be people that are going to come back to life. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of his Christ, Messiah, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. 
literally. Is the thousand years a literal thousand years? Because there are some people that don't believe that. There's no question that this period of time is a thousand years exactly. There are some who interpret the thousand years allegorically as simply meaning a long period of time. However, this view is not naturally read from the text, which is called exegesis, pulling from the text, but rather eisegesis, reading into the text what one already believes. A straightforward reading of the text is very explicit from the literal meaning that the thousand years is exactly that, a thousand years. All right, the words thousand years in the passage above are translated from the Greek words Kilioie, I believe is how you say that, Kilioie, which means a thousand, and etos, which means years. So it literally means a thousand years. It's not a long period of time. Now, there are words in your Bible that, uh, that will come across as one period of time, but in Hebrew, it actually means just a long time with no specific exact time period. This is not one of them. This is one where it means exactly that, a thousand years. All right, so we're going to go through three different interpretations or theories on the thousand years. Number one is post-millennialism. We're going to talk about what post-millennialism is. Number two is amillennialism. And number three is pre-millennialism pre-millennialism. So you have post-millennialism, you have amillennialism, and you have pre-millennialism. Those are three perspectives on the millennium. We're going to talk about each of them quickly before we get into the meat of this message. Number one, post-millennialism. This view is called post-millennialism because it teaches that Yeshua won't come back to earth until after the millennial kingdom. Okay, so post-millennialism is post the millennial, the millennium reign of Christ. So Yeshua comes back after the millennial kingdom. Now, some of you, that may be what you believe. It may be what you're taught. Some of you might be confused at that particular concept. Instead of Yeshua literally reigning from an earthly throne in Jerusalem, Yeshua reigns over the earth through the spreading of the gospel and the establishment of Christian moral ethics throughout the world. So some would say uh, that, uh, that Yeshua is actually not, those who believe in post-millennialism would say, he's not ruling and reigning from the earth, he's actually ruling and reigning through the gospel right now. Okay, That would be post-millennialism. Once a large majority of the world becomes converted to Christianity through this gradual increase of the gospel, Yeshua then will return to receive his kingdom, judge the wicked, and then usher in his people into the eternal age, the new heavens and the new earth. If we continue, Apostle Millennialism teaches that the world is supposed to get better and better as more people become Christians. Not sure how that's all working out. This coming Christian majority world will represent the millennial kingdom prior to Yeshua's return. I'm here to tell you that if this is true, Yeshua is never coming back. Why? Because this is not what we, re- we, we see in reality. We do not see this Christian era that's getting, making the world better. The world is unraveling as we speak. It's getting worse. Matter of fact, if you would just take Christian morals today of what is normal and okay for the average Christian woman to wear in an average Christian church service on Sunday and take it back 50 years ago, you'd be called a harlot. That person would be called a harlot because of the, just the modesty difference. Because the way that morals have worked in America, at least, I can say, is that the secular morals were here and the church morals were here 50 years ago. Then what happened was the secular world lowered theirs and the church lowered theirs. Then the seculars lowered theirs, then the church lowered theirs. And pretty soon what happens is a stair step down into the basement, you have the world's moral depravity and standards are here at the lowest they've ever been in American history. And the churches, we brag about how our morals are much higher than theirs by statistic and percentage, yes. But compare it to the secular society 50 years ago, we're the ones 
that are secular and pagan. Does that make sense? We've slid down this moral road and we've used the government and secular society as our standard for holiness. Well, we're holier than they are. We're better than they are. You don't even want to talk to an ex abortionist that works in an abortion clinic and find out how many church kids are walking in the doors of abortion clinics. So I believe that the world is not getting better because of the gospel. And that's certainly not what our scriptures say. Scripture declares that the days prior to Yeshua's return will be a time of increased presence of false prophets and teachers, tribulation, war, and believers being hated by all nations because of the Lord's name. It does not seem to paint a great and lofty and wonderful picture. Matter of fact, it says it this way, just like it was in the days of Noah is exactly the way it's going to be before the Son of God comes back. And the days of Noah was no joke. It was an an era of evil and wickedness, to say the least. Nowhere in Scripture is the time of the Messiah's return described as a time of peace and universal acceptance of the gospel. It's the Messiah who comes to war against the nations, and He rules with an iron scepter, an iron fist, The Bible says, do you know that the only time that that word is used, ruling with a rod of iron, it's in utter destruction. It's not like a little, you know, poke the sheep on the back. It's destroy. All right, let's move to the center one, amillennialism. Amillennialism, what is that? This view teaches that the millennial kingdom already began at the resurrection of Yeshua. According to Amillennius, Yeshua is reigning right now, and we are already in the millennial kingdom. If that's the case, I quit. (laughs) If we're in the kingdom of God right now, what is there to look forward to, ladies and gentlemen? Amillennialism, if the literal word of Scripture have any meaning, amillennialism amillennialism cannot be true. Because the literal perspective of the Scriptures is Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, is going to come and He's going to rule this earth. You're going to see Him. You're going to experience Him. You're going to feel Him. Everything about Him is going to be emanated from Him to this earth. He's not going to be hidden anymore. He's going to reveal Himself. The first time that He came, even in Judaism, they have two concepts of the Messiah. They believe that there are two Messiahs. One is Messiah ben Joseph, and one is Messiah ben David, or David. And Messiah ben Joseph, okay, uh, is the the one uh, that we would say they're the same person. Messiah ben Joseph is the benevolent one who comes to feed and does what Joseph did, leads from a perspective of shepherding. Messiah ben David, on the other hand, is the one that is, from their perspective, the conquering king. So they're waiting on the conquering king. In Christianity, in Christian circles, it's the same person two different times. So Yeshua, Jesus, is the one who is Messiah ben uh, Joseph the first time. He came as the shepherd. He came as the humble servant. And the second time he's going to come and the Romans will run. That's the one that they're looking for. And that's exactly what's going to happen. So let's move to premillennialism. There's only one left. It's the most popular one by far. This view teaches that Yeshua will physically return to the earth and establish himself as king in Jerusalem which brings about the millennial kingdom. He will regather Israel from the four corners of the world and bring them back to the land where they will rule with him for a thousand years. This view takes a literal interpretation of the Bible concerning the millennial kingdom, specifically with regard to Revelation 20, 1 through 6. You can read on your own. One thing I want to point out here for those that are not familiar with terminology and definitions of Israel, most of the people in the sound of my voice are, but for those that might be new, I want to just give you a quick, quick background. There are many people, matter of fact, there was a preacher on a, a Daystar network just today I was watching, 
and uh, I respect this particular teacher a lot. And uh, I was watching him, and he was doing some teaching on prophecy, and he began to explain the historical uh, etymology of the word uh, Jew in Israel and Israelite. And uh, he made one critical mistake as he began to go through uh, the history of the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, and Israel, is he made the mistake of combining the word Jew to the term Israel. And if you look at the scriptures carefully, you recognize that they are separate but mixed terms. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that, and this is why this is so important, because when you're talking about prophecy, when you're talking about end times, when you're talking about tribulation, when you're talking about Israel, you better know what those definitions mean. Because there is a difference between, in the, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, between the Jewish people and Israel. Israel, because there was two kingdoms split up at the time after the time of Solomon. You had 12 tribes of Israel, 10 were split up into the north called the house of Israel, and then you had two in the south called the house of Judah. When the house of Judah went into Babylon into captivity for 70 years, what happened? That is where the term Jew or Yehuda came from. It came from the Jews that lived because the primary tribe in the southern uh, kingdom, the house of Judah, was Judah. Then you had Benjamin and a little bit of Levi and Simeon. But Judah was the primary tribe, so they became known as the Jews. The northern ten tribes, they were scattered into Assyria and literally lost their, their identity over the next thousand years. By the time you end up with the second temple being destroyed, the northern kingdom completely lost their identity. They have no idea who they are. We don't know where the Danites are. We don't know who the Naphtalites are or the Asherites. We only know where the southern kingdom is. Why? Because they came back from Babylon. And that is the Jewish people today. So the mistake that many eschatology teachers make is they don't understand that when the Bible talks about gathering the four corners of the earth, the scattered tribes or the diaspora, those that are in dispersion, it's not talking about the Jewish people only. It's talking about all of his people, especially the ten lost tribes of the northern kingdom that were specifically said and prophesied they were scattered to the four corners of the earth. So when, they are, when the Bible says, I'm going to gather those that were scattered, it's specifically talking about the northern tribes, the house of Israel. Let me take a breath. Whew. Okay. And there's identity crisis in less than 90 seconds. If you've never heard that before and you want a much more uh, at breadth and depth teaching on that, I encourage you to watch Identity Crisis, and that will help you get a further scope on this subject that is so important. Because why is it so important? Because when we get into the tribulation, when we get into revelation, if you believe that it's just the Jewish people, then when, when, the, when John, inspired by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, in the book of Revelation, starts talking about Israel, you're going to assume that it's talking about the Jewish people, when in fact, it's not. If that's what the case was, then when the Messiah comes back, and when the new Jerusalem comes down, there would only be one gate, and that would be the Judah gate. But unfortunately, fortunately, there are 12 gates, one for each tribe. And every believer, listen to me, if this is new for, to you, you, there is no gate for the Gentiles. So if you consider yourself a Gentile Christian, that may be great and you may be emotionally attached to that terminology, but I'm telling you, when the Messiah comes back, you will be walking through a different gate. And that gate will be one of the 12 tribes. My Bible actually goes on to say that when the Messiah comes back and we are brought to the land, if you do not know the name of your tribe, guess what you get to do? You get to pick where you want to live in Israel and where you actually settle with your family is the tribal identity that you will have. And so, unbelievably, we see from Genesis to Revelation, everything is about Israel. Everything is about the, the number 12. That's why there are 12 constellations. There are 12 baskets of bread, 12 disciples, 12 children of Jacob, 12 of Ishmael, 
You have 12 of everything. Yeshua was how old when he was in the temple for the very first time? He was 12. That was probably a coincidence. There is no coincidence in the Bible. Everything revolves around this concept. It's perfect number of government is the number 12. Can we continue? All right. Premillennialism. This view seems to be the most biblical view in the sense that there will be a literal future kingdom in which Yeshua will physically reign on the earth. I don't know about you, but I don't want to reign on this earth without somebody backing me. I want... You know, when, when, when the Philistines went out to fight, guess who went first? Goliath and his brothers. Why? Well, they're 15 feet tall. I'd send them out first too. You could stand behind his calf muscle and never be seen. Matter of fact, not to go on, on a side note, but how many stones did David pick up? He picked up five stones. And many of us think because uh, David was, uh, maybe he wasn't a very good shot or he wasn't very confident. No, he was so confident. In, and by the way, we're talking 120 miles an hour, those stones could go. 120 miles an hour. You wouldn't even see it coming. He was so confident and so accurate with that slingshot that he brought five total stones because he knew that Goliath had four other brothers. And if I take down Goliath, I might have to whip all of them. That is the confidence and faith that David had in his king. Whereas many people that are prepping for the end of the world, they, they have a house to live in and then they have another house full of ammunition. The only ammunition I need is knee pads. To get on my knees. Some of you think, oh, that's weird. Was it you yoga? You know... No, to get on my knees and to pray. And I'm not saying that preparation is, 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 is a bad thing. I'm preparing myself for whatever that looks like. But I can tell you this, that when my Bible says that I speak to a tree and a mountain and tell it to move, and I look at Satan and say, get behind me, he's got to obey because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I don't need to ask him twice. The best way to prepare for the end days is to prepare your life and your soul. Prepare for judgment, says the Lord God. That's why we're in the month of Elul. That's why tomorrow starts Tishrei. It starts the beginning of the end. Now is the time to return to your king, says the Lord. Stop preparing to fill your stomach and start looking from the manna from heaven, says God. It's the only thing that will actually satisfy you in the end days. A passion for truth, the premillennialism view is the view that we take. I believe, we believe that Yeshua is going to come back riding in the clouds and he is going to set foot on the Mount of Olives and you're going to know it. You won't have to see it, you will feel it. Yeshua will come back to establish his kingdom after the great tribulation. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Revelation 19 through 20 describes Yeshua returning to earth to his people, defeating his enemies in war, and then immediately establishing the millennial kingdom. There's no pause. There's no wait. He doesn't come halfway through. He doesn't come in the beginning to rescue you from your, from your troubles because you're just a, a, just a soft little kitty and he doesn't want you to get your feelings hurt during the great tribulation. You are the bride of Messiah that is not ready and he is going to make sure he presses you until you are formed into the likeness of his son and worthy to be called the bride of Messiah. That is from Genesis to Revelation. Tribulation is to be welcomed for the saint and the bride. If you do not welcome tribulation, you are probably not the bride. You might be a wedding guest. That's a whole other teaching I don't have time to go into. You can get it. It's called Who is the Bride? But there is a difference between the wedding guests and there's a difference between the bride. That's why Yeshua gave the parable of the, of the, of the wedding feast. Both were there. One is the bride who's ready, those five virgins, and one is not. I don't know about you, but I don't know a Christian alive today that, that is not excited and can't wait for the Messiah to come back. Think about what I'm about to say because you're the same. 
Everybody is waiting for the Messiah to come back. Everybody says, I can't wait till Jesus comes back. I can't wait till he comes. It's going to be so exciting. It's going to be like reverse confetti is going to be lifted from the earth. Everything's going to be amazing. It's going to be a giant birthday cake. Welcome home. My Bible tells me that we will be weeping. I would venture to say I will be one of them. Why? Because no one, listen, see, we don't read our Bibles. We read into our Bibles what we want. We want to be happy. We want to be comfortable. We want to be secure. We want to be full of power. And we're so decrepit and our bodies are falling apart that we've created an illusion of what that day is going to look like when our Bibles say it is dark, it is gloomy, and people are going to fall to their faces and their knees and declare that He is Lord. And it's not going to be, your Lord, Lord. It's going to be in tears and in mourning and in sadness and sorrow. Why? Because no no one can stand before a holy God. And when you recognize the depth of your wretchedness, you cannot stand. It's not that He forces you to fall and to kneel. You will fall on your face because why? Because darkness cannot stand in the presence of light and we don't know how much of darkness in Egypt is inside of us. This is a day like no other day. It's why they call it the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, am I saying that it's going to be like that forever? No, but that day, I don't know about you, but when the Lord Yeshua shows me my mud on my face when I look into His Word, it is not a high five. Because to think that you are worthy, you are unworthy. In the very place that you believe that you are clean, He removes His feet from that place and walks away. In the very place that you believe you are unclean, He stands in defense of you. Do not believe that there is anything inside of you worthy to even meet or look at Him when He comes in the clouds. The moment you even believe that you will be rejoicing is the moment you will actually not see the very pride in your heart. I know this is hard, but understand that Yeshua is not coming to give you a high five, ladies and gentlemen. He is coming to judge His people first. And we see what happens to His enemies. But the Word says He judges us first. Could that be why we are weeping? Something to think about. Matthew chapter 24, verse 31 says, And He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet. They will gather His elect from the four winds, from one corner of heaven to another. Do you know what the elect is? How many have heard of the doctrine of election, predestination? Let's solve it for you real fast because the Bible gives us exactly what election is. The only people in the entire Bible that have ever been elected by God are the chosen people of Israel. They're elected. They fell away from grace. The northern kingdom was, was divorced from, from His grace. They were sent to the, the, the four corners of the earth and they were predestined to come back. That's what it's all about. Doctrine of predestination or election is simply God saying, I chose my people They've disseminated into the rest of the nations. I will be a small tabernacle amongst them. My spirit will be among them. I will send my son to rem remind them of who they are. And then I'm going to go gather them from everywhere that they are. Not the blood. I'm not talking about blood relatives or genealogy or anything like that. I'm talking about the real people of Israel are the children of God. I want you to, to, to finish this statement with me if you know your Bibles. God inhabits the praises of you guys have been sitting under my preaching too long. You like ruined that whole moment right there. If I was in a particular, any particular Christian church in America, they would have said his people because that's what the Bible says. It says God inhabits the praises of his people. But if you look at that in, in Hebrew, it does not say that. It says Israel. God inhabits the praises of his people. You must be part of Israel if you are going to be his people because the new covenant is only given, according to Jeremiah 31, 31, to the house of Israel 
and the house of Judah. Amen? All right, Zechariah 14, one of my favorite chapters on end days, says this, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split into two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other half southward. And a river comes from there, heads to the Dead Sea, and cures the Red Sea. That's what happens when the Messiah comes back. He begins to heal the earth. But not just that, He comes to destroy His enemies. We don't have time to go through all the Scriptures, but in Revelation 19, 11 through 21, in Second. Thessalonians 2 8, for those of you that are taking notes, and Zechariah chapter 12, 1 through 9, and 14, 12 through 15. All dictate very clearly Yeshua is coming to destroy his enemies. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but for those of you that are uh, eschatology buffs and you love end time stuff, let me just throw something out to you. I want you to draw a mental line right down in the middle of your head. And I want you on one side, I want you to, to look at, at this side is his people. And on the other side is not his people. This is the typical uh, picture that we build in our minds. But how many of you know that God is a God and a pattern? He's a God of pattern. And whatever he does is always the same generation to generation. He loves patterns. He also loves circles because the whole universe down to atoms and stars and suns and planets are all circles so we see patterns everywhere the pattern that i want to show you is that it's not just this greek concept of left brain right brain any medical students in here or anybody that are nurses or anything it's not just two halves is it how many are there how many chambers of the heart are there two halves four chambers you see the same thing in the brain. You see the same thing uh, in our appendages. Two halves, four parts. In the book of Enoch, strangely enough, when he ends up going to Gehenna, the fiery hell, he sees multiple chambers, not just one. So we, in our Greek minds, we could say good, bad. Restaurant, fast food. We don't see anything other than that. I want to suggest to you that on the righteous side, those that are His are split into two groups. You have the bride and you have the wedding guests. Don't have time to go into that. On the other side, I want to suggest to you that you have the enemies of God and you have the unrighteous. It's a concept that I don't have time to dive into, but I'm going to put it on your lap for those of you that want to study that, that when God says that He's going to come, He's not coming, I believe, and I could be wrong, I just want to be on this side in case I'm wrong, but I believe that He's coming to destroy His enemies and will deal with the unrighteous. Unrighteous means that you are unclean. Righteous comes from uh, diakonos in the Greek, means to do the right thing, the commandments of God, to keep the divine laws, is what the, the, the uh, Thayer's Dictionary says. So to actually be righteous is to be tamim, in Hebrew, to be complete, mature. It, it's actually the con connotation of a bride that is ready for her wedding day. She's rehearsed and she's ready. She's mature. You don't give a wedding dress to a five-year-old. She's not ready. She may have a wedding dress. She may be the heir to the throne. She may be absolutely royalty, but she's not tamim. She's not mature, not lacking anything. And if you know your Bibles, you know I just quoted from James. What chapter? One. One. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance. And let endurance so that you complete itself so that you may be what? Mature and complete. It is literally giving us the definition of the Hebrew concept of tamim, being ready for your wedding day. You cannot be ready for your wedding day without tribulation. This is why the tribulation exists. The destruction of God's enemies happens after the tribulation. The tribulation itself, the primary goal, is to make the bride ready. Can I get an amen? 
we're not ready. So God comes, Yeshua comes, He destroys His enemies, but there will be survivors. How do we know that? Because Isaiah 13, 12 says this, I will make the people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. That's not a pretty statement to to say that mankind is going to be difficult to find when it's all over with. Billions are going to die with a B. A third of the earth is going to die just from polluted water supply. That is 2.3 billion people just from water. Isaiah 24, 6 says, Therefore a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. They're not utterly annihilated. There are people that will survive. Zechariah 14, 16 says, Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king. Yahweh Sevaot, the Lord of hosts, which is the angel of the Lord, which is actually Yeshua himself. If you want more information on that, I encourage you to get the Trinity on trial where I explain how all that works, who was really talking from the, from the burning bush, and to keep the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Sukkot. How many know that just 10 days from now, the Feast of Sukkot is going to be here? We will be doing what? We will be rehearsing for our wedding. You see, the feast days of Yahweh are not the feast days of the Jews, they're the feast days of what? The Lord, the Bible says. They're His feast days that He gives us to help us to prepare so we can see the prophetic significance. Not that we can just look at it. See, Greeks do what? We get into libraries, encyclopedias, and eventually we invented Google, and that's how we learn. We learn from looking and observing, reading, and taking in gnosis, knowledge and information. That's how we learn. Hebrews do not learn like that. They learn from doing. It's called apprenticeship. Let me ask you in your life, in your spiritual journey, are you following Yeshua so closely that you can hear Him breathe? Are you learning how He deals with things? Do you hear His voice in the still small? Do you feel the spanking? Are you that close? I don't know about you, but I love the discipline of the Most High God because I've told my wife this and people close to me, I'm under it now. I'm under the judgment of the Most High God and it is the greatest blessing that you could possibly imagine. You know why? Because to be disciplined by the Lord God means that He loves me and I am near His hand. You cannot be disciplined if you are away from God and not in alignment. That's why children run from dads that are ready to spank them. They fear the hand of God. We should not fear the hand of God. The hand of God is there to press us and protect us. Do not judge. Only say what you see. A wise man once said. Be an apprentice. Do not be an observer or a learner. Only be an apprentice. But that's a message for another day. Who will be a part of His millennial kingdom? Believers who are raptured into the air at Yeshua's second coming and brought back to earth to enter into the millennial kingdom. Now, there is a discrepancy of whether or not they will actually be raptured into the new Jerusalem or will they be raptured into the air somewhere waiting for that 10 days of awe to complete where the other destruction of His enemies are complete and uh, we are ruling and reigning from the earth, or excuse me, from a, a, a hovered perspective, if you will, a covering over the earth, and then we come down to the earth? No one really knows. I'm not even sure where I land on that. But I do know that we will, we will be raised from the dead. The dead in Christ will be raised from the dead. And those that are alive and remain that are His will be caught up to, together with Him in the air. That alone is cool to me. I don't care how it happens. Believers who died and are resurrected after the battle of Armageddon, they will be resurrected from the dead. Everyone from Genesis chapter 
whatever chapter it is that Adam dies, all the way, because how many know Adam is not in heaven yet? He would be in a gated community for sure, okay, and wearing plastic surgery probably so nobody could recognize that it's all his fault. But everyone that is, is righteous is waiting for that resurrection. It's called the resurrection of the just. We'll talk about more of that in a minute. Those who survive the tribulation. So there are multiple people that make it into the millennial kingdom. Those that are alive and remain that are righteous. Those that are resurrected in the first resurrection, the resurrection of the just. And then those who survive the tribulation. What will the millennial kingdom be like? Here's a few biblical thoughts. Yeshua will physically reign as king in Jerusalem, sitting on the throne of David. This fulfills the Davidic covenant promised to Israel that a king from David's line will rule and give Israel rest from their enemies. Yeshua will also reestablish the temple, a house for his name, as it's called, in those days. There will be a real temple that will be built most likely during the tribulation. How many know that the altar for that temple is already built? The utensils are already built. The menorah is already built. They're looking for a red heifer to begin the sacrificial system. I'm telling you, the temple is a short time away before they lay that first stone. Yeshua will reign as king. What does that look like? 2 Samuel chapter 7. There we go. Verses 10 and 11, and I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them. So they will dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. Violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, I, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Right now, there is no house of Israel. There's only the house of Judah, which is modern-day Jewish people. But there is no house of Israel. He's going to make the house of Israel again by gathering them from the four corners of the earth. So his people can be one. That's the whole concept, by the way, for you Bible students, of Ezekiel chapter 37. The two sticks of Israel are going to be put together in the master's hand of Yeshua, and that is the day that it happens. 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and 33 says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Isaiah 11, 3-5, And he will take delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by more mere appearances or make decisions on the basis of hearsay. I think this is interesting. Isaiah chapter 11 one of the descriptions of Yeshua as king is that he is not going to judge by mere appearances or make decisions on the basis of hearsay. Why is that in the Bible? Do you know why? Because this is what we normally do. We normally judge by appearances and hearsay. We never just judge based on the facts. Matter of fact, we just judge without knowing anything. We see something, we judge. Matter of fact, last night I was uh, doing a Bible study with my kids, and my wife uh, brought over this book and a story that was amazing. I wish I had it with me right now. I would read it to you. But the nutshell was this. There was an old man who had a beautiful white horse, but he never sold it. He was a very poor man. And the, the village people gave him a hard time and said, you are a fool because you do not sell this horse. You could be rich and live comfortably. What do you need this horse for? You don't even ride it. One day the horse rides away and the village people judge the man and say, see, we told you were a fool because the horse that you could have sold just left. And the, and the old wide ma wise man says, don't judge, just state the facts. I had a horse and it left. We don't know if it's a curse. We don't know if it's a blessing. The next day the horse comes back. 
And it, and it brings 12 wild horses with it. And the village people went, oh my goodness, the man is a wise man. He's right. It wasn't a curse. It was a blessing. Now he has 12 horses plus the white horse. And the, and the wise old man said, do not judge. Only state the facts. The horse left. The horse came back with 12 horses. We don't know if it's, it's a curse. We don't know if it's a blessing. We just know we have 13. And they said, oh, but you're a fool. You have 13 horses. Most of us only have two. And at the end of the day, what happened is his, his son comes and his son uh, breaks his, his, uh, his, both of his legs on one of the horses and they say, we, we knew that it was cursed. And they begin to judge again. They said, don't judge. You don't know. Just state the facts. He was on the horse. He fell off the horse. He broke both of his legs. The next week, the two, there were two countries that went to war and all of the sons got enlisted to go to war. But the old man's son could not go because both of his legs were broke. And the villagers said, what a wise man. He was right again. It was a blessing. It was not a curse that your son broke his legs because we've lost all of our sons. And the old man said, will you never learn? Quit judging. You don't even know. Just speak what you see. My son is not going to war. We don't know if it's a blessing or a curse. And the story goes on and on and on. And it's almost humorous because the village people never learn. They're village people. <laughs> but aren't we just like that? We judge righteous. We judge, oh, it's a blessing. It's, we don't know if it's a blessing or a curse. Just stay what you state what you see because what you see may be a blessing in disguise. How many of us, if we were 2,000 years ago, would have said that it was a curse that the Messiah died? If you didn't know the rest of the story, that would be a pretty dark day in Israel, in your family's life, and the utter humiliation that you left your job and followed this guy for three and a half years and he ends up dead on a cross that everybody could see. We're talking about the ultimate Facebook challenge. <laughs> Social media to the max in Israel on a hill, on a cross, and not only is he humiliated, but every follower that followed him was intimately humiliated. Whose test was it? Was it Yeshua's test? Or was he judged because he passed the test? And now it was their test. Not everything that, see, that looks the way it is, is the way it is. The tribulation is the same. He will treat the poor fairly. He will make right decisions for the downtrodden of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and order the wicked to be executed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is in the millennium. Most of us have grown up thinking that we're going to somehow grow like three foot wings and sit playing harps on a cloud somewhere. And my Bible, and, and, and eating chocolate for my daughters out there. My Bible says that it's going to look a little bit different than that. Because right here, we still have people being executed. Whoops, missed that verse, didn't we? Justice will be like a belt around his waist. Integrity will be like a belt around his hips. A good leader would do good to read the characteristics of the Most High King. Integrity is at the highest. Will we reign with Yeshua? Revelation 5, 9 through 10 says, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you were ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God. And they shall reign, where? On the earth. So the people of God reign with Yeshua on the earth. So we get to rule and reign with Him. Revelation 20, verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those whom the authority to judge was committed. So there will be a hierarchy system, and there will be people that will be allowed to judge with Yeshua. How many remember Moses in the Exodus when he comes out 
and God gives him what has been deemed as the Moses model of leadership of a congregation, which is you need leaders of 50s, tens, 50s, hundreds, thousands, 10,000s. You need executives, the 70 elders, and you need a visionary. That's how it works, right? That same concept was brought down into the synagogue. This is exactly the concept and the pattern that Yeshua is going to have in the second coming. It's not going to change. Not we're not all going to be equal. I hate to hurt your feelings. It's not the way it works. If that was the case, Yeshua would have not said in Matthew chapter 5, hey, uh, you know, there's least and greatest in the kingdom. How, do we How does he judge? There are definitely going to be judges that are going to be helping him judge. What are the characteristics of those judges? The previous verse. They're going to have already proven themselves on earth. You don't get chosen to be a judge in the millennium because, you know, you, you are a better looking judge than the other person. You get chosen in the millennium based on what you've already done. It's over with. There's no second chances. There's no tryouts to live in the, in the, in the city. Revelation chapter 20 verse 5 says this, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. What dead? The wicked dead. And it gives a title. This is the first resurrection. Colon. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death, death has no power. What's the second death? Those that are thrown into the lake of fire to be destroyed. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. Matthew 24, verse 30 and 31 says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of man, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet and call, and they will gather His elect from the four winds from one heaven of the earth to the other, like we read earlier. Now let's talk about modern-day Israel, the Jewish people. What happens to them? Well, if you read the Scriptures carefully, what you're going to find in Zechariah chapter 12 is that they're going to come to know Him by the thousands. They'll already be prepared. They will finally realize what they've been missing all along. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, modern-day Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look upon me, on whom they pierced, they shall mourn for him as one that mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So the inhabitants of modern-day Jerusalem or the Jewish people will begin to see the mistake that they made. And they will weep as well, recognizing that they missed the Messiah. There will be universal peace, but it will be mandated universal peace. It will not be necessarily voluntary, uh, it, it will be voluntary, uh, but it won't be the way that we've all grown up learning what peace is, which is everybody is just perfect. It's not going to work that way. It is pretty much the way the earth is now, there are going to be real people living on the earth. They are going to need ruled over. There is going to be hierarchy. There's going to be still jobs, still going to have to row a hoe, still going to have to harvest. Here we go. Micah chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. I don't have time to go through these. I'm going to go through a couple, but just for those of you that are taking notes, Isaiah chapter 11, 6 through 9 talks about the lion will lay down with the lamb, will chew the cud just like the lamb does, no doubt about it, still not going to go up and, and pet a lion, sorry Lord, it's going to take me a few hundred years to realize that that thing's not going to bite, but it does say that kids are going to play and, and, and snakes aren't going to bite them. There is going to be a universal peace from the perspective of creation, from the perspective of humanity, there will be mandated obedience. The Bible says that, I think it's in Isaiah chapter 2, that the Torah is going to flow and come out of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. The first thing he's going to do is teach his people who he is and the standard of the kingdom. There's going to be a law, a constitution of the kingdom. You see, he's been preparing us all along for his kingdom by actually living in America. You get a really good picture of what the kingdom looks like. From the perspective of how it was founded. It was founded upon a constitution. 
What's a constitution? It is a written agreement of, and statement of declaration and fact that you cannot change. You cannot change the Constitution. Can I get an amen for that? At the end of the day, here's what we've got. God has a kingdom. He has a Constitution. It cannot change. According to the Bible, it doesn't change. He doesn't change. He never will. Your relationship to that Constitution can change, but the Constitution itself does not change. We've been bought and sold a bill of goods to believe that the Constitution of the kingdom has changed. It has not You'll have prolonged life. I need to hurry up here. I only got an hour left. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20 says this, No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. And no, that's not Willie Nelson. It does kind of look like him, though. But you're, now, what I want to point out about this, if you leave that slide up for just a second, in Isaiah chapter 65, it says this, it says, An old man who does not fill out his dates, for the young man shall die a hundred years old. How many of you, by raise of hand, were told that when you get to heaven, when Jesus comes back, that uh, no one's going to die? There's no more pain, no more dying, the old things are passed away, everyone's going to live right forever and ever and ever until ever is over with. I did. But the Bible says that's not what the millennial kingdom looks like. People will be born, people will die. But if you notice and you know enough about your Bible, what part of the Bible does this most sound like? The front of the Bible. When men lived hundreds of years. Do you follow me? Because what, the reason why they lived hundreds of years is because they were in alignment with the light, with Yahweh, with the Creator, and the world that they lived in was not polluted by us yet. And so there was a synergistic harmony from the, the creation and humanity of which He created and allowed us to live a long time. So that's going to happen again. It is only after the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ where there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and that's when we live forever in a completely different state. There will be no more uh, dying. There'll be no more marriage. There'll be no more uh, births. Uh, Can I get an amen from all you ladies? Uh, Everlasting joy. Isaiah 61, 7, instead of your shame, there will be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they will be rejoicing in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For the righteous, this is going to be a great day. It's going to be a thousand years, and I mean that day literally from the perspective, excuse me, a prophetic day is a thousand years. Six days of creation rested on Shabbat. 6,000 years of humanity, we rest on Shabbat. If it wasn't so and the Shabbat wasn't important, we wouldn't be resting for a thousand years. So for those of you that do not believe in the the Sabbath or do not believe in the fourth commandment, I can assure you, you'll be thankful for it when you get to rest on it for a thousand years, okay? They'll be full of joy. God will put everything in order. It will be a kingdom on earth in order. Imagine this earth right now with a bunch of stuff fixed in creation but instead of the UN running the entire world, we have King Yeshua running the world. That is what it's going to be like. Although you'll have a glorified body too if you're righteous, which that will be pretty awesome. Israel receives an inheritance. All of Israel, including faithful Gentiles who join Israel through the blood of Yeshua, are given an inheritance in the land. It's going to be a really big deal. Land is a big deal. See Ezekiel 47, 21 through 23. We are almost finished. There'll be children that'll be born in the millennium. There'll be an increase in the birth rate. Jeremiah 30, verse 19 says, I will multiply them, they shall not be a few. I will glorify them, they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me. So we see a repopulating of the earth. How many people do you think will live on the earth by the time the thousand years is over? Billions again. 
Zechariah 14, 16 through 19 says, everyone's going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Everyone. Can you imagine? <laughs> Celebrating the Feast of Sukkot, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you're sitting at a bonfire, and Yeshua comes down, and He comes over, He's got a stick in His hand with a kosher marshmallow. <laughs> and He says, anybody want some more? I'm sorry. <laughs> he has to translate that. Isaiah 66, 23, everyone will keep the Shabbat. Everyone is forced to rest. I'll never forget when I was uh, uh, working in siding the windows, my boss, uh, I was the only salesman of the company and, and, and the manager of the company, he, he, uh, he wanted me to, to make more money. And he wanted to do this. And I remember getting into kind of an argument with him. And I said, you can't make me make more money. And then I realized how stupid that sounded. And we both laughed. <laughs> and we went out to lunch. Well, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, you can't make me rest, you know. But God says, you need a rest. And that's why he created it. So for a thousand years, everyone's going to be blessed to be in obedience with His commandments. Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, Yeshua teaches the Torah to all the nations. You can look up all these, these scriptures. Yes, it's true. And if you're watching this for the first time and you thought, well, uh, you know, I don't believe this. It's okay if we don't believe it. I didn't believe it either. But when I learned to read my Bible, this thing became a life that's something I've been missing that's been a part of me for all these years as a believer that I'm missing something. What's missing is the Constitution. And once I learn that it's there and then I learn how to relate to it, then God begins to show up. And because he, we're, He's looking for those that will worship in spirit and truth, the power begins to flow. Will there be a millennial temple? temple? Absolutely. It's clear from Ezekiel 40 through 44 that the earthly priesthood and the Levites will be reestablished to serve in the temple. I know this is a shock to many people around the world that are believers. It's clear that even animal sacrifices will also be performed in the millennial kingdom. And believe it or not, virtually all Christian theologians who hold the premillennialism view, they understand this and completely acknowledge it. You can't get away from it. It's the plain, plain reading of the text. If Jesus came and died for your sin, there's going to be sacrifices in the kingdom because that's what it says. There's no way to get around it. So what about the sacrifices? Let's talk about that for a minute. What do those look like? Does the reinstatement of animal sacrifices nullify the death, burial, and resurrection or the sacrifice of, of, of Yeshua, Jesus? Absolutely not. Let me give you a quote from Tim LaHaye. doesn't matter what you think about Tim LaHaye, but I thought this quote was interesting. The offerings will be memorial and retrospective, looking back to Christ's finished work on the cross instead of looking forward to Christ. That's a quote from him. Tim Haig, Messianic theologian, says this, once we have seen how the scriptures describe what the animal sacrifices in the tabernacle and the temple actually accomplished, we can see that they have never detracted from the once-for-all-time sacrifice of Yeshua. And he goes on to say, since the animal sacrifices were never given to make infinite payment for sin, which God required, a payment only the infinite and eternal Son of God could accomplish, we recognize that offering a sacrifice at the tabernacle or temple could in no way diminish the value of Messiah's death. Now, the way that I like to look at it is this. How many of you uh, get your meat from a local uh, butcher, a local uh, deli? Okay, now when I was a kid, my dad used to go to a place called Rolla Meats here in town and get a lot of our meat directly from the butcher. Now, in, if you take that concept that doesn't go back too far long ago where that's how it worked, and you take that 2,000 years ago, if when you uh, wanted to give an offering to God, you would simply take your offering to the priest, they would sacrifice it, and then in some cases, you would get part of the sacrifice, the temple would get part of the sacrifice, and that's your dinner with your meal that night, with your family that night. 
It's the priest were the ones blessing the sacrifice. So what we look at as an archaic and bizarre ceremonial sacrificial system was a way of life for them that was a blessing to offer God part of something that you got to take care of for years and bring it to the point where you could sacrifice it and give it to God and still join in that beautiful dinner, knowing that the the priest or Yahweh is having dinner while you're having dinner with the same animal that's called covenant of pieces. See, it's not so archaic then when you put it in that kind of language and terminology. At the close of the millennium, we will have fireworks. No, it doesn't say that. (laughs) I hope so, because God knows I love fireworks. But Satan will be released to deceive the nations. The nations will be full of people at that point. Jerusalem will be surrounded by God's armies. This is before Okay, the, uh, uh, the new Jerusalem, but the Jerusalem will be surrounded by God's armies, uh, God's enemies, I'm sorry. And then God will bring down fire to totally consume them. Can anybody think of a story in the Bible where this already happened? At Mount Carmel, Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. What, they, what happened there? There was a contest, there was the altar. There was the water, there's the moat, the fire of God came down and destroyed them. And then they gathered up all the enemies of God and destroyed them. It is a forepicture of the end days where it says that Elijah is going to go before what? The great day of the Lord. This is it. Elijah, Mount Carmel, as a picture and foreshadowing the Messiah, or excuse me, the fire of God is going to come down from the throne of God, which is from where? The heavens. Fire comes out from the throne, just like the two sons of Aaron destroyed them. Anything unclean will be destroyed, just like that. This is judgment. Revelation 20, verse 7 says, And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the corners of the earth four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. This is going to be a giant battle at the very end. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. We know how the story ends. Revelation 20 verse 10 says, And the devil who had deceived them, deceived who? all the people of the earth. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, how is it possible that people could actually rebel when the Messiah is living on earth? Think about it. It's a thousand years. How many, are, how many start the millennium? Very few, the Bible says. So that means there's a thousand years of people that have never even had a contemplation of this world that we live in right now. They have no concept of earth without Messiah. They're born into a Messiah kingdom. They don't know anything different. So for them, it's this guy ruling and reigning from Jerusalem and the grumblings that happen, I would imagine, throughout time of how this guy is making them go up for Sukkot every single year and so on and so forth. And eventually, the enemy comes and begins to stir the negativity and the heart like he always did. They'd never seen Satan. So when this guy shows up on the town and he has all the answers, he begins to deceive people left and right, starting at the top with all the leaders. And next thing you know, Yeshua, who's the one who came to save the earth, becomes the bad guy and they say, let's go get him. And Everybody goes and surrounds Jerusalem, and then it's game over. You see, let me just give you just a small uh, rabbit trail for just a second. This is the pattern of how God redeems. He lets the enemy set the trap. Then he lets you sink into the miry mud right before the trap. You complain that you're sinking in mud in quicksand and that your life is miserable and you're sinking in the quicksand as you were just, God, I was just roaming through the forest looking for you. You said seek and be, and you would, I, I would find you, but I'm not finding you and I'm sinking and I'm about to die. Why did you let me fall into this? You didn't even see the trap that was laid for you that you were about to step in that would have killed you. He's just wearing you out until you realize that you can't do this anymore. Then when about the time that you, that you get to the place where you're totally immobilized, the enemy, all the enemies and the gremlins of the forest, step out from the forest to try to kill you because now you're totally immobilized. You are Jerusalem. 
The enemies totally surround you. What they don't know is in the saliva that is falling from their teeth because they can't wait to sink their teeth into you. They forget about their own traps. They walk into their own traps and the fire of God comes down and destroys them. And then grabs you by the hand, pulls you out and says, Son, thank you for being faithful and thank you for being quiet, but this is why I put you in here. I put you in here because I used you as bait to draw all of the enemies to you so that I could get rid of your enemies in one shot. And we complain about sitting in the mire when the mire is the very place that is in the center of his will in the forest. You want your enemies to be destroyed. Don't judge. Just say, I'm in quicksand. I don't know if it's a curse. I don't know if it's a blessing. But it would be really nice to see a white horse right now. Is that making sense? All right, we're almost done. After Satan is thrown in the lake of fire, the wicked dead are raised. They miss out on all the action. The wicked dead are raised from the dead. And they're only raised for one reason, judgment. Everyone that's alive, well, we'll get there in just a second. Everyone that is is judged according to what? What they've done. Listen to what I'm about to say. They're not judged on who they know. Not right now. This is judgment on what you've done. Our entire society is built off of works. You get rewarded for what you do. Somehow in Christianity, this, this, this unbiblical demonic idea got promulgated throughout Christian uh, centuries that once you get saved, that's your judgment. There is nothing left. You're either saved or unsaved. My Bible says, no, 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 no. You have a name, a badge that's put on you. That's your saved or unsaved. But after that, you're carrying a shopping cart of whether it's rewards or punishment or lack of rewards, I should say. Based on how you live your life is based on what you will receive in the kingdom. Now, here's the million-dollar question. Well, what is he judging off of? What standard is he judging off of? Because I want to make sure that when my credits, when I get to heaven, when I get to the kingdom, whatever that looks like, that I want to make sure that I pleased him and that my cart will be full. You might say, well, are, are, you, are you serving God for rewards? No, but it is absolutely part of the deal. God wants to bless His people. The Bible says that if, if a father knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much more? Look, my father, when he, when he sent his son on earth, Yeshua did not tell his disciples, I go and prepare a triple wide for you. He says, I'm going to go and prepare a mansion, a mansion. There are many mansions he's going and preparing. That doesn't mean there's not going to be a triple wide park. I'm just saying. But there are mansions. Anyone who is not found in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. But for those that are righteous, there is another book called the book of of works and that book is going to be opened in everything you have ever done said or even thought of thinking is going to be brought out during that day and you are going to be judged by what you did and what you didn't do and by what you could have done and for me, that last section is the scariest section because I, like Josh Talia said in his seminar, one of the most impactful statements I've ever heard in my life is he said, I don't want to get before God and meet the Jim Staley I could have been. Put your name there. The great white throne judgment. Revelation 20 says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who seated on it from his presence on earth and the sky fled away and no place was found for them. The dead were judged by those that were written in the books according to what they had done. Revelation 20, 13 through 15, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they have done. 
We're so focused in Christianity on who you know, you better know Jesus, you better know Jesus, you better know Jesus, you better know Jesus. We're so busy in giving the gospel and trying to get people saved. On judgment day, the majority of the context of what's being focused on is not whether you know him, it's what you did. That's a scary line to be in because you might find yourself in the Lamb's Book of Life and you might give your five high five to the guy behind you, but then there's a whole nother judgment waiting. Are we ready for that? Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the Book of Life, they were thrown into the lake of fire. Then we get to the new heaven and the new earth. No more death. Death itself is thrown into the lake of fire. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven almost 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles long. It is a 1,500 mile square. Some suppose that it's a pyramid because it's 1,500 miles high. Could be a cube, could be a pyramid, could be, we don't know. We just know that it's big. Do you give you an idea? It's a third of the size of the United States of America is called a city. That's a big spaceship. There will be no temple. Why? Because the temple is the Lord Himself and the Lamb, according to Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and the sea was no more. So once the enemies of God are thrown in the lake of fire, what happens? The new Jerusalem comes down onto a new heaven and a new earth. Everything else is changed. It's different. And there's even a new constitution because He is the temple. No longer will there be a regular temple. It says that He is the light. So for those of us that believe in Torah, we believe in the front of the book and the back of the book, even the interpretations and the prophetic significance that we understand from the Torah to to the New Testament, how Yeshua fulfills the Word of God, we will not even be able to comprehend the true meaning of Torah until you actually get to the new heaven and the earth, the eighth day when you get to actually see what the real temple really looks like. What was really in the mind of God before man sinned, where Yeshua is the light and you are the temple. We are simply a small microcosm, listen, of the eighth day. We don't replace the seventh or the sixth. There will be a temple in the seventh day, but you are only a down payment and a deposit and a small picture of what the eighth day is going to look like, where the Messiah lives in Jerusalem, and He is the light of the world, bursting through. And that picture, although uh, a good picture that our graphic artist put together, does not give you the real picture because it is not gold. It is clear gold. It's 100% transparent. What is the picture? The entire city is made up of gold that is transparent gold. The light goes into every room at all time and bounces off of every wall. Everyone has light. What is that the picture of? We are not supposed to be closed off. We are supposed to be a community of believers that are transparent, so purified by what? Fire. So purified by the trials and the tribulations of life that we become transparent. Somebody say amen. We become transparent. What's hiding becomes exposed. And we go, that's humiliating. I don't want to do that. I don't want everybody to know my laundry. God says you better get used to it because in the kingdom, you're going to be with no walls. In the kingdom, it's going to be transparent. In the kingdom, there'll be nowhere to hide. 
What's weak will be strong. What's strong will be weak. You will, there will be no more death, no more pain, no more hiding. The former things are all passed away. So if you want to be like the kingdom that you are right now in that microcosm, then open your chest and say, God, expose who I am now so that when I stand before you in judgment, I won't be embarrassed. I would have been crushed before my men on earth and I would be glorified before your throne. Better to be humiliated now than before trillions. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, repaired as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard, what's it say? A loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. The real dwelling place of God we will never see until the end of the thousand years. The Messiah comes, but the Father God is in the New Jerusalem preparing the place for eternity. The 1,000 year millennial reign of Messiah is promised to the Son of God because of what He went through on earth. And I don't have time to go into it, but it's all based on law. That because of the obedience of the Son of God and because of His giving up and sacrificing Himself, His reward, the Scripture says, is He will get to rule over the very people that crucified Him for a thousand years. At the end of that thousand years, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 15, He gives back all the authority that was given to Him back to God so that Yahweh, all-encompassing of the Father and the Son, the Ruach, can be all in all. Then, there's a new heaven and a new earth. He gets to rule for one day. After that, the Father God and all of the host of heaven and everything that was in the mind of God and the abode of God comes with a new heaven and a new earth. And from that perspective, we don't have a clue of what that's going to look like. But if you want a picture of what you're supposed to look like, it is that eighth day city. Go and look up that and study it for your own. You'll get some revelations, I promise. That new heaven and new earth, Revelation 21, 3 and 4, I encourage you to look at it. We're going to keep moving here quickly so we can get to the very end. Here is the final closing slides. Why is this important? The literal millennial kingdom validates biblical prophecy. Without a literal future kingdom, none of the prophecies concerning it or connecting it could even remotely be fulfilled. The disciples, along with the rest of the Jewish people, believe in a literal messianic kingdom. Yeshua commanded his disciples to pray for this kingdom to come. A literal millennial kingdom is the answer to their prayer. Final thoughts. Heaven is not going to be in the clouds. Harps, high fives, and watching Netflix for free. (laughs) That's not heaven. Heaven, my Bible says, is going to be here on earth for a thousand years. Heaven is all about establishing His kingdom, His authority, and His constitution. You will be a subject of the king. You will not play by your rules. You will play by His rules. If you don't like His rules, read the end of Revelation to see what happens. The kingdom will be organized. It will be established by law, and that law is clearly Torah. He teaches it from Mount Sion. Our rewards and status in the kingdom is determined by what we do on earth. So please implore and hear me as if you're hearing God Himself right now when He says, please don't make the statement, I just hope I get there. It's offensive to God. It's offensive. He is not looking for a bride that hopes she might have a dress for that day. He's looking for a bride who is well-equipped, well-adorned. She's picked out everything. She's practiced. She knows what to say. She's memorized her lines. She knows who to look for. She knows who the counterfeit groom is. She's ready. She's waiting. And she's sweating in nervousness and excitement. That's the bride that he's looking for. He's looking for one that is not afraid to go through a little tribulation. Matthew 5, 17-20, I'm just going to read it. Do not think 
that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but I came to pleru, which means to fulfill. The very same Greek word is used three chapters earlier when it says that I came to fulfill all righteousness. How is it that we theologians have, have somehow over time interpreted that I've not come to destroy the law and I came to get rid of it? And we wonder why agnostics and atheists stay agnostic. We don't make a lot of sense. No more than he came to destroy righteousness. He came to fill it up. One husband, one man, one woman. Half, half, come together, filled up. Not destroyed and done away with. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will pass from this law till it's all fulfilled. Matter of fact, he goes on to say this in the most powerful scriptures. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments. What's he talking about? The law, the Torah, the very least of the Torah. And teaches men to break the least of the Torah. So shall he be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does and teaches them. What's them? The commandments of God. What are the the commandments of God? The Torah. He shall be called great in the kingdom. Why? Let me ask you this question because I've never asked this before from the pulpit. Why is there a hierarchy and why does God say least in the kingdom for for, for breaking the commandments and teaching them to break them and greatest for those that teach the commandments? What is it about the commandments? Why is it? That God says He elevates those who know His Torah and teach it, and He de-elevates or He uh, he, uh, uh, brings people to a lower place in position for those that don't believe in keeping His commandments. Why does He do that? Obedience. Think kingdom-minded. If you're a king and you're about to come and you're going to establish a kingdom, what's important to you? Loyalty, obedience, blessing, all of those things. But what's most important is that your people know the constitution of the kingdom. So whoever is teaching the constitution of the kingdom deserves to be the judge. They deserve to be elevated into a higher place of authority because they know the law. Who are the highest laws of the land, ladies and gentlemen? Who are the highest people in our land? Is the judges. Why are they judges? Because they know the law. They teach it. They preach it. They eat and live it and breathe it. I'm not saying that on earth that they do it the right way, but in using this analogy, understand that this is why we must know the Word of God. Because to know the Word of God is to pay homage to your King and say, I respect the kingdom of God even now before it comes. This is a compliment. Imagine the King that says they don't even know what it's going to look like. They have no idea what's coming. They're stepping all over each other, trying to figure it out. And my God, my daddy says this. Don't fight over trying to figure it out and who's right or wrong. You're all wrong. (laughs) But keep trying and practicing and rehearsing for your wedding day because when the day comes I'm judging the hearts of men the motivations of men and the knowledge of men of my word that's why it says this Revelation 12:17 the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. Not one or the other. It's both. You're showing us the enemy is most scared of those who have the Spirit and the truth. He's most scared of those who know the front and the back of the book. Because if you know just the back of the book, you only have the power of God. If you know the front of the book, you know how to use the power of God. You can hold a sword all day long and say it's pretty and not know what it's for. 
How do you love God? 1 John chapter 5, very simple. We love God by keeping His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. You may not know how to do it. You may not understand it. God's not looking for the bed to be made perfectly. He's looking for you to try to make the bed. The one that comes in and says, I can't make it. It's The bed's too big. There's too many pillows. I don't understand how to do it. That's me. He's not looking for that. He's looking for the one that will try. Who's going to get more benefit from the the father when the father comes home, when two sons, when one of them says, Dad, I didn't even try because it's impossible. And if I break one of the commandments, I break all of them. And I know how mom is if I break one of her pillows. Or the other son that says, Dad, I know it looks terrible and I have no idea what I'm doing, but I tried. I knew all the pillows went on the bed. I knew the cover was supposed to be folded a certain way, but I know I got it wrong, but I did my best. Please be pleased with me. Who's going to get their arms wrapped around that child? That child that tried. Don't try to get it perfect. Just try for the one who is perfect. Almost done. I know I've said that 18 times. <laughs> Look, by the time I get done, you're going to see a white horse, okay? It's a reason why we, God wanted me to wait two years to do this. The end of the age is coming. <laughs> Holy smokes, we got like 1,000 slides here. That's what, give me two years and that will happen, right? Thank David Wilbur for that too. Romans 8, chapter 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life. Look, for those of you that are watching for the first time, listen, watch this verse that you've never read. Because I didn't read it this way either. The carnal mind is enmity towards God. I don't want to be carnal. I want to be living by the Spirit. But the Bible says, for the one that is carnal, if you have a carnal mind, it's not subject to the law of God. Nor indeed can it be. So then those who are of the flesh cannot please God. Every theologian that's listening to this, dissect this scripture and see if you can get it to say anything else other than if you're in the flesh, you're not following the law of God. That's what it says. You cannot even please God unless you are in the Spirit, and it defines in the Spirit by subjecting yourself to the Torah of God. Let me say it in your own language to help you understand because we don't like the word Torah. We don't like the word law. I understand why we don't like the word law. We broke away from England for a reason. But let me just say this. We, if your enmity against God is you're not subject to His constitution. If you're not in the kingdom constitution, you're against the kingdom. That will not preach in most pulpits today. But it's the law of God and it's common sense. You're going to live in the, and you're going to li- let me just say it the way my daddy said it. You're going to live in my house, son. You're going to play by my rules. Let's go one step further for fun. I brought you into this world. I can take you out of this world. Had a few of those moments. Hi, Dad. The foundation of all law, Matthew chapter 22, verse 40, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What two commandments? Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And you do that by loving your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest commandments upon all of the law, Hanks. It doesn't say they're the only two commandments like we've all been taught. It says that all of the law hangs off of those two great commandments. And interesting, and I taught this last week. You should look it up so you could see it on, on a real slide. But the word Torah in, in, in Hebrew, each letter is a number. And when you add up all the numbers of the word Torah, you get... 611. There are 613 laws. Torah, the law, has 611 built into its name. And Yeshua says, oh, by the way, I didn't miscount. They hang from the top two. There's your 613. Built into the word itself, God is telling us that the Torah, the law of God, hangs 
on love. So I encourage you and ask you this final question. Are you ready? Are you ready for the white horse? Are you, don't judge. You don't know whether it's a blessing or a curse. All you know is the white horse is coming. Are you ready? I used to think it was a blessing. Yeshua's coming. And the mere fact that I made the judgment that it's a blessing, I deceived myself into thinking I'm ready. Do you hear what I'm saying? But I look now and say I'm not going to judge. He's coming, and I, but I do not believe that I'm ready. And in the mere fact that I believe that I'm not ready, I'm ready. Do you understand? That's from God's perspective. Because those who think lowly and have been judged will be lifted up according to the Scriptures. The millennium is not about understanding it. The millennium is about living it now. It's preparing now. Understanding the language. Understanding the directions, the instructions, the manual, the constitution, the kingdom principles of which you were created for. All of Torah is built for the purpose of loving Yahweh and loving people. And we get caught up in the details. Should the pillow be moved this way? Should it be overlapping this way? When my wife makes the bed, it's amazing. It literally looks like Dillard's or something. When I make it, it's more like a, pi a, a pillow of pyramid. I'm like, well, this one looks good here, and that one looks good there, and no one's going to want to stay in our guest room if I have to make the bed. But see, God is not looking for perfection in catalog front cover pictures. He's looking for clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. Stand with me tonight. If you were blessed by this teaching, please consider helping us reach the nations by making a donation today. Thank you and God bless.